everybody. How are you this morning? Good. Good morning, Trent. How are you? I'm great. Good. We are going to get started right away with the most exciting part of the day. Birthdays. Yes. Yes, birthdays. I know. Birthday time. Birthday time. So happy birthday today to Emmett Havitam. I'm not sure on that one, but happy birthday to <laughs> you. you. So confident. I know. You just say it like you know. You uh, Caleb Mesh, happy birthday, happy birthday to you, buddy. Gideon Balsley, happy, happy birthday. birthday. Rylan Ramirez, happy birthday hey, to Rylan. you. Honor Pratt, happy birthday. Yay. Wait, Lori last week, that's like the famous, like the Boswell family. Last I know, right? Was, I actually thought yeah. of that. There, it's the Boswell had month. A good birthday. I didn't hear, but. I'm hoping it went well. I'm sure she did. Matt was going to do all kinds of great things for her. Special, so yeah. I know. I don't know where I am on my list now. <laughs> oh, I know. And that's okay. Lori Leslie, happy birthday to Lori, you. Happy birthday. Sandy Dempsey, happy birthday to you. And Paige yeah. Brewer, happy birthday to you. And guess what? In another week when we do birthdays, you can tell them happy birthday in person because we <gasps> oh. will be on the lot next week. Yeah. So anyways, happy birthday to all of you. We hope you are celebrated wonderfully this week. And now we are actually going to get started with some wonderful worship today. So we would love it if you would stand up and join us. Yeah. Turn up the volume on your TV. This might be, someone was telling me uh, before last week that, that uh, this might be their last chance to worship in their PJs. If you're planning to join us next week, then yeah. So if you're out there, turn up your volume, stand up with us, sing as we worship our almighty God. I was buried beneath my shame, yeah. Oh, who could carry that kind of weight? Yes, it was my tomb till I met you. Oh, yes, I was breathing, but.
want us to sing this old hymn, Jesus Paid It All. Today, uh, we're going to be celebrating communion at the end of service, and uh, just that we are reminded He paid the price for us. He gave His blood. He sacrificed His life so that we might have life. Let's sing this together.
Christ alone. Christ alone. Cornerstone, oh, we made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. Sing it again, Christ alone. Jesus, we remember that as we think ahead to taking communion. God, for your sacrifice for us, it changes everything for us. Thank you so much for your grace, your love, your sacrifice, your blood shed for us. Jesus, we love you. We praise you for you are good, you are holy, you are worthy, and we love you. Help us put all our hope and faith and trust in you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you so much for your overwhelming love for us. In your name, amen, amen, amen. Thanks for taking some time to worship this morning with us. And as we continue, we have a little special something honoring some people from a little video we want to show you here. So check this out. Isn't that big cool? Deal. Yeah, that is Congratulations. a big deal. Congratulations! We just want to say to all yes. our graduates. Yes. And uh, wow. 
It's a big deal. They were a part of our church for a long time. Some of those, yeah. I was like, I, I taught you in junior high. I like have, have so taught your I'm blown over by some of those things. One, like, like a, a doctorate in mathematics. I know, right? Albany. Isn't that Albany just crazy? Is a rock star. I just yes. can't even imagine and fathom what math classes she had yes. to take. Yes. And then another thought just goes out. I don't know if they caught it, but the Smiths, yes, have four, four. graduating and headed off to college. So I was joking so, with her. There's got to be some kind of support group for people right? like it's, that, right? <laughs> four kids in college yes. all at once. Yes. It is Shocker. a big deal for the parents, too, though. I mean, this is exciting for the kids. It's a new chapter, and then there's the parents' feelings and yeah. everything that goes with that. Yeah. And then our feelings as a church, you're part of our right? family. Sending and them on, we want you to and know that. Out. Yeah. And, and there was one other thing. I don't know if you caught it on there, but I was really excited about Oh, Oregon Ducks. Right. Yes, you saw I it. I did. You I did. I tried to be like, no, I'm excited for like you. Like they were, they were there. like full on. Maybe there's time full still. On. You can change. I got to get some of that Maybe. gear like that. I know. Because I can be I like know. decked, like she head was, to toe in green. Yeah, she, she was, was decked really, out. So we'll, It's true. Yes. But we are excited for you guys. It's very exciting. And I thought it would be <laughs> awesome just uh, if we could pray for our graduates. Yeah. It would be super cool. So yeah. I don't know if you've got a graduate with you while you're watching. Yep. If you know of one, think of them in your mind. And Dana, would you pray? for them. I would love and, to pray uh, for them. Let's do that. And uh, yeah. let's just all agree together for their futures that God would be with them too, especially as they yeah. head out to college. Yeah. I know college can it's be a, a tough deal. time in yep. faith, right? And you're yep. challenged in your faith. Yep. Um, a lot of kids might turn away from God and those things, explore other things, but we would just be praying that, that yeah. they would draw close to God, find a church family that they could connect yeah, with there too. Yeah, that's a big deal. That's super that's important. That's a very big deal. It's a very yeah. big thing. So yeah. let's do pray that. Pray with us if you would. Jesus, we just thank you so much for these amazing seniors and each face that went up there. I just recognized and loved and loved that they were a part of our church over the years. And um, I do consider them part of our church family. And that is a big deal to start from, that you would have a church family to kind of have in your background and as your foundation as you as kids go out from here. And I pray over them, God, that they would acknowledge you in all their ways, um, that they would continue to do that, that as they, in their studies, in their friendships, in the things that they decide to do and not do, that every decision would be made to honor you and to acknowledge you, that they could be lights to people around them, God, that they could go out from here being missionaries and creating disciples and that they would see this as a missionary opportunity, God. Um, I thank you for what you've created them to be. There are some exciting things up there that kids are going into. And so I just pray that you would give them diligence in their studies, that you would give them wonderful friends and support groups that would lead them closer to you. Um, God, just as they go into this next exciting chapter in their life, God, that they would remember their hometown church and come back and visit sometimes even, God. Um, we want to be a part of their life even from here forward in any way that we can. And so we just thank you for who you've created them to be, where you're taking them, and what you're going to do in and through them. And we just ask your blessing over them. We also ask your blessing and your strength and courage over their parents, God, that um, this is a big deal for them too, and lots of hard work for parents and Lots of change coming, so we just pray that you would be with them as well. Bring them comfort and excitement as they watch their kids grow from here. So we just thank you, God, for who you are and that you can be in each chapter of our lives. And so we just pray that that would be the case for each of these young adults, these young adult men and women of you, God. And just thank you again for them. In your name, Jesus, amen. 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 Thanks, Dana. Yeah. Awesome. It's exciting. It's super exciting. Yeah. Man, I just play blessing over you guys, all you seniors headed off to school. Yeah. And that may be an awesome And I awesome think there's year, different things in the town also that you can watch for. Like there was a or is gonna be a parade coming up or something for a senior. So oh, there's still like yeah, so there's still little ways that you can be a part if you want to do that and support Definitely. them in that way. So watch celebrating for those. them. So yes. we've got some other fun things coming up. Yes, this summer. we do. We're going to label them off and talk about them. Yes. Not every one of them because we actually have a lot. There's more things. There's not, Lots this isn't even summer. everything that's no, on the list. No. Summer is packed summer. full, you guys. You do not want to miss these I things. I put these in order, though, here. We've got okay. them in order, so okay. chronological. You don't need to worry about the date specifically as much now. Just show up whenever, apparently. It doesn't matter. We've got... We've got... My favorite day. <laughs> no, just kidding. It's not his birthday. It's not Father's Day on June Father's 20th. Father's Day. Fantastic have... surprise yes. Father's Day. So, so we, stay tuned. Stay tuned. We There's can't give planned, details. And we got the, we got the no. like hush hush that we yeah. can't say what it's going to we be. We were going to, and we got fun. told, no, you're not. So we're not. Super fun. You won't want to miss that yes. Sunday. 
definite. Next. Then we have All Church Family Camp. Yep. End of this 24th. month. It's going to be June exciting. June 24th. There are still spots available. You can sign yes. up and be there. We would love you to come and be a part mm-hmm. of that. It'd yep. be awesome. And then another fun thing. This one's kind of a creative Ooh, fun yeah. thing I'm excited for. The Hub Cruise-In. So that's for like classic cars, not your minivans. Not my minivan. Not I your know. minivans. No, I know. He's bummed. Sorry. But we said no to that. But that will be fun coming that's up. That's in July. In First July. part of July. July 9th. Yep. So if you've got a car, we would love to have you get that. Not just any car. Tyler, a classic car. how's your car coming? It won't it be won't here. Be it here. Won't Tyler's be. car won't be oh, here. One day, Tyler, it will. We're it's going to be, breath. yes. It's going to be awesome. Yes, that is. so I think you can look for details, but Scott Thompson has yeah. the details on that. Invite a neighbor, a friend, if you know if they've got yeah. a great car, too. Be yep. a part of that. It would be Very super cool. fun. And, and then, then our other thing in July. The one I keep getting excited about. Yay, yay VBS. VBS. July 12th through 14th. Registration has started. Woo-hoo. Names are coming in, so... We are excited for that. Lots more details going to keep coming out. So be yep. excited for that. I think we said that. they're pouring out. Yeah, last right? week where they're pouring out. Details and uh, yes. excitement. excitement. I think excitement at least is pouring out from you, Dana. I, I hope tell. so because I am excited about it. it. it I'm stoked it is, about it. It is. It is. I it's love be getting great. kids together and they're going to learn about Jesus and they're going to bring friends and they're going to have snacks. Who what more could you want? That. I know, right? Snacks and Jesus. Right. That's what it's all about. Snacks <laughs> all and Jesus. All we're going to do. Snacks That's and all you Jesus. Have that. Yes. So. Okay. The biggest thing, though. Wait, real quick, got. we forgot. Oh. Are we doing that later? Communion? Oh, that's later. Sorry. That's okay. Cancel I'll that. Biggest thing it. we've got. Biggest. The biggest, biggest thing. Biggest. The you guys biggest. know this. Are you guys so, ready? I don't know if I'm going to get emotional about this. Are you going to? Maybe, because. I did not see that coming. Yeah. So this uh, could be our last stream. We have one week not, left. Not on, streaming only. only. Yeah. Streaming only. We've been doing this. For like a year year and a a half. half, Okay. That's a big deal. Next week, we are together outside. Our prayer, and you can be praying for this too. We're hoping, and and hopefully this is going to be good, that the school will have us back in the fall. Yeah. And um, so we can gather together as a church. You know, I told you I was on vacation a while ago, and I got to go visit a church, and it it was emotionally super impacting uh, for me. I got to be there with some friends from Mm -hmm. old, and uh, just to worship together, and man, just... Enjoying God's presence and hearing his word and everything people. and doing it with other yeah. people that we do yep. life with. So I am super excited for that. And I'm hoping that you will all make plans to be here with us. It's it's yes. going to take work, right? It is easy to just wake up and flip on the TV and or turn the jammies. TV. Yeah, stay in your jammies. It Just Eat turn the snacks. TV on. You can turn the TV on whenever you want with that. You don't have to worry about being late right. and stuff like that too. Right. So it's a shift, but we are hoping that you will do that. We won't want to throw guilt out there, but we are just hoping that you will show up. Because we're excited to do life yeah. with you. We want to do life in person with you. I just think it's about that too. Deal. Like those people from church you know, that I'm friends with, like, you're, you're, some of your best friends could maybe be there at church, and yeah. you don't even know that yet, yeah. right? People that you will connect with, people that you will do life with, yes. and uh, that will help you in, your, in yep. your faith, that will help you through your hard times, through good times, and stuff like that, and could be there. Yeah. So, man, make plans to do that. Please come. We want to see you. Definitely, we yes. want to see you. And we want to see you not just there. We want to see you involved and in helping out. Yes, we do. Right? Right? Maybe mm-hmm. you used to help out. Maybe you've never helped or served or anything it's in the past. It's a good time for you. Maybe you're brand yes. new to our church even, and you're like, man, I've just watched online and never even seen what they do There's in person. There's a place for you. We have a thing in uh, just some of our, um, what do we call them? It's not the statement of faith, but just our belief. Mission statement? Mission. And, and just believing that everyone Vision statement? sweeps, right, of that thing. Everyone sweeps, meaning that we want everyone to be a part of mm-hmm. what we are doing and serving in some kind of way to make stuff happen. Well, yes. Sunday mornings takes an army to make stuff happen, it does. right? We're kind of going out there with a mini army. <laughs> for, for outdoor because uh-huh. it's it's still we're like ramping right. back up when we get back to the fall in the school it's going to take an a army bigger again. army yeah so mm-hmm. we would love for people to help in all kinds of different ways right they yes. can help with kids ministry lots of areas in kids ministries teachers check-in teams snack preparers uh we're doing videos we're doing games we're doing i need lots of help and it's going to be fun i mean Super once you fun. hear us over there you're going to be like oh, oh yeah. i should go over there and hang out and, and the fun. neat thing is we're going to do worship Super with the cool. up- upper grade Yes, right? K, K through, through fifth. fifth grade, we're going to start out with on the on lot, lot with all the adults and do yep. worship together. So you don't even have to miss because we only have one service. So yep. we there was a few only different one. thoughts put into this, but we want you to be able to be a part of 
worship with everybody in that way because we've all been missing it. And and I want to be a part of it. We want the kids to see their parents worship and to kind of just participate in that way. So we're going to do that all together. And then the kids will be dismissed to go to Sunday school and the teachers would go there. So you would still get to be a part of seeing people and worship and hanging out. Yeah. So it's going to be really fun. We need your help. So if you would like to, you please You could serve with some of your kids. Us. You could serve yes. with what high school kids could serve. Yep. Junior hires with a parent could yes. serve. Yep. You could do stuff as a family. You could help with setup and or tear yes. down as a family. Donuts and, doing and coffee. That. Donuts together. and coffee and mm-hmm. serving and things like that. Yep. Um and the tech areas with, with video yes. and graphics and things like that. Yep. There's a, even room and sound. And, and you can Always. be trained. Like if you feel like yes. you don't exactly know, there can be training for yes. you. To and we're not know looking for to people this. to come and like, oh no, I'm here strapped in for the rest of my life. We would love you to do right. like, you know, our people were trying for like one to two times a month. Mm-hmm. And that's maybe you're gone for a lot of the summer, but maybe you're like, hey, I'm here Couple two times weekends a month I know in the summer. Yeah. We can yep. use you. Email me at IMRC if you want to, and mm-hmm. I will find a place and talk to you to plug you in. Yes. Even if you have a small chunk of time, every part yes. is valuable and is going to make it happen. Yes. And then we're all apart, and then it's wonderful. And then it's wonderful. We're one big happy family. It's wonderful. Yay! So actually, yeah, because we're, we're tearing this stuff down. Yes. Which is crazy. All this. I don't know if you guys can pan around here and go out wide or so just to show, but All we have had our away. studio in here. You can't even see behind the cameras, but it's kind of crazy back yes. there too with more lighting and it stuff like, like that. It looks like a real studio. All these curtains. But uh, stuff's happening where we're taking all this down. Yep. We're it's cleaning be carpets a kids so it's area. ready for kids. We're cleaning yep. out rooms and stuff like that for classrooms. Yep. So we are making it all yep. happen. It's all changing over. It's all going to be something and we're praying. new and exciting. We don't exciting. have to go back to it. Be praying for that yes. that we will be in the school. It'll be super exciting. And you should bring your own chair also yes. for On the Lot. Bring your own chair if you'd like to sit. June 13th. June 13th. What time? And... 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock. 10 Don't forget. O'clock it's a later. Time. Why are we doing it later, Dana? So that I can be on time in the morning. Yay! No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we are doing it later so that if you feel so inclined, you can go have a picnic with somebody, take your kids yeah. to a park, go out to do lunch. lunch afterwards. Do have fun some social things. Times. Yeah, get to be together and really, you know, we've missed that social yep. connection with our church family. I always think it's so important to see it as a church family and we yeah. hang out together and we do life together. Yeah. We go through the ups and downs downs of life together, but you can't really do that if you don't ever see each other or hang out or talk or whatever. So we want to give opportunity, provide opportunity for that to happen. So Great. that's one of the reasons we we're will doing still it later. Be, there will still be a stream on there. So if you are yes. still at home or traveling, you'll still be able to watch that. That's true. But yes. we would love for you yes. to join us here. Yeah. All right. On that. La- oh. uh, so, so, uh, at the end, you mentioned it. Yes, we're having yes, communion. Sorry, we have we communion said that. So make up. sure you've got your Just communion elements ready. Yes. And uh, up next, Matt is kind of in his three part chiasmus. I, was, I wondered if he was going to say series, it's a big word. Right? Chiasmus. I learned yes. chiasmus. I didn't know what chiasmus meant before, mm-hmm. but I do now. Yes. And uh, so we've been enjoying that message, continuing yeah. in that on uh, the scandalous God. Mm-hmm. In the book of Luke. And uh, so Matt is coming up next. Hope you enjoy the rest of today's this service. This is a big deal. This is yes. our. Trent Dana show. <laughs> guys, <it's> we'll, so, <laughs> we'll see you next week in person. I'll see you guys. It's Bye. so great. <laughs> church and it is crazy to think that again this is this is really the last we we do we pray we pray that this last time that we are having to do this in the kind of sound stage studio hub kind of environment but it has been a huge blessing as well i I love to say that everything teaches in fact uh, you're going to hear me say that probably later this morning but this whole last year teaches this environment for i think even us as leaders and pastors and, and everything like that it teaches for you as followers of jesus 
it teaches. And our heart is always to want to be able to take in what it is Jesus wants to teach us so that from that we can live more like him, rely on him more, have kind of his ultimate kingdom perspective. And that's what we're going through in the gospel of Luke. And in particular to the section we're in this morning, Luke chapter 13, it's all about that. It's about kind of unlearning old ways and embracing new ways or unlearning religious ideas and embracing kingdom values and models. And so it's a challenge. It really pushes all of us to do that. And yet I am grateful for the fact that Jesus loves us enough to make that kind of investment, to keep working in our lives and tinkering so that from that, it's less about us and it's more about him and his vision and dream for the world that will literally bless the nations. And so that's what this heart is all about today. That's what we're looking at here in Luke. And so right now this morning, I want to go ahead and just have us pray uh, to get ready for today. I think especially today, because we're going to like hit a lot of things really quick that we all know, but we almost want to treat like our marching orders for life. And so I'm going to pray and then we'll jump right into it. And so let's go ahead and do this together. Jesus, I thank you for the fact that you are incredibly patient with us, but you also put attention that says, but you know what? Go further, go farther, go faster. I know you can do it. And so you call us to follow you in such a way that it's not about ease or comfort. In fact, it may demand a great deal of things from us, but in the end, you also promise to reward And so I pray that we will learn your lessons, that we will embrace your heart, that we will advance your kingdom, and that it won't be about our comforts in this world, but rather us leveraging our lives for your message in this world so that others in this world might come to know you. So we look to you, Jesus. We certainly love you and thank you in your good and kind name. Amen. So... Every time I teach through a book of the Bible, uh, it's interesting because I realize I, I'm always learning something every time. Like there's things I know and then there's things I forget and then there's things where I go, wow, I've just never thought about that before. And for the Gospel of Luke, this is very interesting to me because I'm a big synoptic Gospels guy. The synoptic Gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Those are kind of my favorite section of the Bible and then Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament, another big favorite section of mine, Right. But one of the things that has stood out to me in Luke that I've never seen before is how much ink is spilled talking about the religious leaders that were against Jesus. And I thought this was kind of weird. Like when it started to click in, I'm like, here's Luke and he's writing to his friend Theophilus about, hey, here's what the Christian life looks like. Here's what it means to follow Jesus. Here are the things that we're supposed to live out and do. And then there's a ton of ground covered in these conflicts between Jesus and the Pharisees or Sadducees or the lawyers or whatever. And I'm like, why? Like Luke had limited finite paper. Wouldn't it have been better for him to say, you know what, then Jesus healed this woman and I'm going to tell her story for a minute. Now she went back to her village and reached people and everything else, but you don't see that kind of thing or how Jesus raised this kid from the dead. And then he went back with his mother here and things happened. It was really cool. Like Luke doesn't do that as much as he keeps writing about the conflict between these two groups, Jesus and religion. And I'm like, I just, I don't get it. Why so much energy? And then I realized, like I was saying a minute ago, everything teaches, everything teaches. And so there's something in this where it's like Luke as a writer, the Holy Spirit working in him says, I want you to go ahead and talk about this a lot. Because when I think about this, I think all the stories about religion and its opposition it's pride, it's love of law, it's disregard for embracing a new way of thinking, it's hypocrisy, it's judgment, it's failure. All of those are there to teach us as Christians. And I think it's to teach us as Christians this simple idea that we are all tempted to backslide into religion. There's a lot of information about religion in the gospels to warn us, to say, listen, you're going to be tempted to do the same thing. You're going to want to fall victim to the same traps. You want to embrace the same love of law over love of people or over love of gospel. And I've seen it throughout my life as a Christian. There is these temptation moments where you start to become a legalist or a moralist or just judgmental, or everything gets politicized, or we start to treat things like a meritocracy where you merit and earn things in this life, or you merit or earn things even in the church. And if you don't live up to the standard, then somehow there's a punishment for you that's less about how grace rescued you and more about how you failed in an expectation. And from that, there should be some consequence that you have to suffer. We're all tempted to do it, right? Every one of us. 
We're tempted to the same fruitless, loveless, lost, and forsaken spirit as the Pharisees or Sadducees, but we might just do it in the name of Jesus. Because what I've realized over the course of time is we're tempted in two ways. We're tempted either to follow the world in very worldly ways, or even to fight the world in very worldly ways to be ungodly in both kinds of frameworks. And so from that, all the more we need to be reminded of what Jesus is trying to get at in this chapter, which is his followers must think different. Now we've been talking about this chapter and how this is uh, the structure that we've talked about, right? So literally it's a crossing effect. That's what it means in Greek. And so we've learned that Jesus says religion must think different. Religious, religion must repent of the ways that it views things and views things in a new context. And so it must repent of fruitlessness and lovelessness and its lostness and its forsakenness. But as we have learned, repentance is from something and then also to something. So they needed to repent from these things, but repent to a new kind of kingdom. This vision that Jesus has for the world that changes everything. That's where religion needs to go. That's where his audience needs to pay attention. And that's what Jesus wants to teach. And here's why. In his world, the Jewish nation, they had a vision of the kingdom right? So they were longing for their Messiah and their Messiah would come as a conquering king that brings in this violent kingdom that wipes out all the bad guys, wipes out the pagans, the sinners, the untouchables, the unlovelies, the unwanted, and then sets Israel up as the supreme nation over all other nations. And so the only kind of Messiah that they were really going to be interested in was the kind that was aggressive, demanding, and commanding. That's the guy they want. That's the guy they're longing for. That's what they're praying about. But then Jesus rolls in and he starts pushing a kingdom that not only is unlike the kingdom that the Israelites desired, but frankly, he's pushing a kingdom that's unlike the vision of the world in, as far as how you get things done right? So in the world, it's the strong, it's the leaders, it's the forceful to get things accomplished. But now Jesus is rolling in and he's trying to talk about a very different kind of kingdom. And it's so different, it's going to be hard. It's so different, it's going to look like a narrow way when wider ways are more feasible and more functional to the way the world works. But that's exactly what we learned last week, right? Jesus said in Luke chapter 13, verse 24, work hard, agonize to enter the narrow door to God's kingdom for many will try to enter, but they will fail. See, not only is this challenging, this idea of the narrow door, which we will finally define this morning what narrow door living is all about, but it's not just that it's challenging, but that it challenges. It challenges the very assumptions of how you get stuff done in the world. And that's the thing I think is the biggest challenge about the message of Jesus. I think it's very easy to look at this and be like, that's not real. That's not executable. That's not going to see things accomplished. That's too much of being a pushover, being silly, being crazy, being too opposite the world to be of any functional good. And Jesus is like, right, that's why you need to rethink things. You need to see the world differently. You need to see my vision for the world differently because I am not coming to vanquish my foes. I am coming to reach my foes. And that is the vision that you and I, friends, we need to embrace. That our calling in the world, the reason we still have our boots planted on the ground on this mission field is not so we can convert the mission field to a battlefield, but rather we can see outsiders become insiders. We can see enemies become friends. We can see those who have been pagan turn to being into people who praise God. That we can be ambassadors of a message of peace between God and humanity in such a way that Jesus says, even if it costs you your life to see others have life in Christ, it is worth it and I will reward that. That is a very different kind of kingdom. It is weird. I'm going to be completely frank. The kingdom that Jesus pushes in the Gospels is odd. It is strange. It is bizarre. It is a, just a phenomenon you look at and you go, there's no part about this that should work in the real tangible world. And you know what that odd, weird, strange thing is called in the Bible? Holiness. Holiness. See, holiness simply means uncommon. It means set apart or sanctified. 
Here, here's the problem with holiness. I had a friend of mine recently ask me about this. He says, I've been hearing your definition on holiness, but holiness, doesn't it simply mean, again, uncommon? And I go, it does. But we have to measure against what, right? That's just kind of an open-ended descriptor right there, right? So it's ambiguous. If something is holy, it's being compared to something else. And here's what's so important about this, right? This is where it's a little bit tricky. Uh, When Jesus is dealing with religion, religion thinks it's holy. And here's a little secret. It was. The religion of Jesus's day was uncommon. It was set apart, right? It was set apart from the world in such a way that it adhered to law and stayed separated from everybody else. It was so separate, in fact, it looked at the rest of the world and said, they're going to hell. The rest of the world, they're sinners. The rest of the world, they don't know God like we know God. That's how holy the environment was that Jesus was dealing with. But then Jesus rolls in with a different variant of holiness. And his variant isn't stay separated from the world. His version of holiness is very simple. Doing things in unworldly ways. It's being so uncommon, so other, that the world looks and says, whoa, that's not how we do business, right? We're used to force and might and strength and all of these factors, and and you're bringing something altogether different. Here's why I go back to this idea of holiness, by definition, is being uncommon in that you love, in mercy and justness. See, holiness does mean uncommon, But the function of holiness is uncommon by authentically loving people in a spirit of mercy and a spirit of justness. The justness is willing to forgo our own comfort for the sake of others, and we do it in mercy, and that is the essence of love. And so the religious leaders had an unholy holiness, right? And they stood against the world because of that. But then Jesus is bringing in a holy holiness that stands for the world, by giving himself to it in unworldly ways, loving the unlovely in very strange ways, caring for the broken, caring for the ugly, caring for your enemy who doesn't want your good and yet you want good for them. That is holiness. That is uncommonness playing out in the world. And for the world, it's going to seem reckless. For religion, sometimes it seems like you're selling out or it's silly or you're not being committed to the truth, right? It's like to love in this model, you have to have faith in God, that God has called you to love in this way, that kind of reckless abandon to making that type of investment into those who may be unwilling or uninterested or frankly might even get angry because of it. But that is the new ethic that Jesus is bringing into the table. It is this ethic of the kingdom. See, for religion, they've failed. They've lost perspective on the kingdom. So now Jesus in the gospel of Luke is trying to give new perspective, accurate perspective, repentant perspective, where they rethink it and do it different. And so from this, he says, here's what the kingdom's like. And he gives two illustrations to the kingdom at the center of chapter 13. Jesus said, what is the kingdom of God like? And how can I illustrate it? He says, that's like a teeny mustard seed that a man planted in a garden. It grows and becomes a tree and the birds make their nests in its branches. He also asked, what else is the kingdom of God like? Well, it's like yeast that a woman used to make bread. Even though she put only a little yeast and three measures of flour, it permeated every part of the dough. Now, we hear that or read that and we go, yes, that's so good. That's so picturesque. That's so perfect. I love those parables. I love those stories. But the original audience that's listening to Jesus, here's what he says. And they're like, you got to be kidding me. That's the kingdom. Jesus never become a sales pitch guy. Do not market anything. That is the worst vision we have ever heard for the kingdom. That is not a kingdom that anyone would want. So let me try to break this down for you because we're 2,000 years removed. We don't live in that culture. We don't understand the dynamics of these stories, both of a man in agriculture and a woman that's trying to put together a meal in some capacity, right? We hear this and we go, oh, okay, the kingdom's like a tree. And we think about that, we go over to the TV here, and we tend to think of really grand, beautiful, awesome things because we love the kingdom of Christ. We believe in what Jesus is doing. This is an important thing for the world. So we picture it like this. It's going to be beautiful, grand, big, strong, tenacious. But Jesus does not say the kingdom's like a cedar or like a redwood. He says it's like a mustard tree, and therefore behold your tree, right? 
That is what the average Jew listening to the story hears when Jesus says it. And then as to the other story, we think about, oh, well, big loaf of bread, beautiful, twisted, knotted, awesome, amazing. That looks so good. But what Jesus actually communicated was more to this. Pretty appetizing, isn't it, right? Looks good, yummy, yummy, right? So what's this all about, right? Well, the original audience would hear his words and think, you just described some things that are troubling that would not be appealing to the average Israelite, right? And so he's disrupting their visions of the kingdom because, again, they want a powerful kingdom. They want a strong kingdom with a strong king, and now he's pitching something that's altogether different. So it's holy in contrast to what they anticipated, right? Again, he's just flipping the script on them. So let's break it out a little bit really quick here. The mustard tree. Uh, Why is this so disruptive to the way they pictured it? Well, here's the first thing you have to understand about a mustard tree. It's a highly invasive plant. Palestinian farmers or people that grew gardens would never put a mustard tree in their garden. It would take everything over. It would just wipe it out. So farmers did not do this. Gardeners were not into this at all. So that's the first problem. The second problem we actually see there that the mustard tree welcomes the birds, right? So if you have a garden, I bet you have a net over your garden. And there's a reason you have a net. You don't want the birds. So why then would Jesus pitch a kingdom that has an invasive species that can take everything else over and invites the very things you don't want because they're going to wipe out the rest of your garden? That's the way they're starting to hear this. And then Jesus talks about the yeast that goes inside the dough and it gets all out of control, right? Even there in the Old Testament, when you read about yeast as an illustration, it's an illustration of sin or it's an illustration of something impure or unclean. This is why at Pentecost, they go around, or uh, Passover rather, they go around and collect all the yeast out of the house to symbolize we've removed all of the impurity from the house. And also in the Old Testament, the idea of birds were connected to the Gentiles, the pagans, or whatever. So Jesus is illustrating his kingdom in ways that for a Jewish listener, they're like, we want no part of that. Why would we want an invasive thing? Why would we want outsider birds? Why would we want this sense of impurity? This is all backwards to our anticipation. See, and and if you even add to it the fact that the Israelites, they were thinking when their kingdom came, it would come with devastating force. He would ride out of heaven and wipe out everybody. And now Jesus is like, ah, well, it starts like this little seed and just grows over the course of time. And as it grows, outsiders come in. And as it's full and big and lush, it's actually kind of gangly and crazy looking. And it's going to look odd to outside eyes. It's going to look something altogether different than what the world would anticipate. And Jesus says, that's my kingdom. My kingdom just is so utterly different. It's not going to look attractive maybe to religion, but it's very attractive to outsiders and unwanteds and uncleans. The people who are the stuff of birds and yeast, that will be my kingdom. And so it's a kingdom that is unconventional and scandalous. It's a kingdom filled with people that are messy and marred and even irreverent looking at times, right? But that is the kingdom of true holiness. That is the narrow door and the true way. In fact, that's the interesting thing to me. When we get out of the gospel of Luke and we look at the gospel of Matthew, we get a sense of bearing on what the narrow door is all about, right? This narrow concept way. But see, in Luke, it's different. He puts it at the center of a chapter dealing with the need for religion to repent and embrace something new. In the Gospel of Matthew, he does us a huge favor. He outlines what the kingdom looks like and then kind of finalizes that message with the illustration of the door. And so this is in the Sermon on the Mount. And what I love about this, and this is where we're getting ready to turn, out of Matthew cha- or Luke chapter 13 and into Matthew chapter 5 through 7, what I love about this is he's like saying, you really want to make a difference Do you really want to be somebody special? Do you want to be an individual who makes an investment in the world in such a way that one day, again, Jesus slides out the chair and says, please sit down. Thank you for what you did. You served me by serving the world that you were in. High fives, fist bumps, you name it. Like that's the scene that Jesus promises for those who serve in this capacity. So what does that look like? What does a narrow door living look like? So, Matthew chapter 5, start of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, See happiness in humility and sadness, in your strength being contained, in a passion for doing right by having mercy displayed. 
Have your purity from the inside. Forgive in such a way that even when people want to persecute you, you know what? You take it with joy. You forge peace in a peaceless world. He says, bring flavor and preservation as salt. Bring warmth and illumination as light. Being people genuinely committed to good so that people would see your God and glorify him in heaven. Seek a righteousness greater than the righteousness of religion. Stow your resentment. Make broken relationships right as much as you can. Seek respect and dignity in sexuality and marriage. Keep your promises. Turn the other cheek, he says. Give twice what's demanded of you. Go two miles when somebody requires you to go one. Love those who hate you, who disagree with you, who disrespect you. Aid by loving them and aid in such a way where you bless them when they curse you, you pray for them when they abuse you, you do good to them when they hate you. That is a narrow way. Give to the poor, pray to your father, fast in a hunger for God. Prove you love God more than money by investing your money into God's priorities. Don't worry about the problems of life. Worry about advancing the kingdom above all else. Figure out how to care for others more than judge them. Since frankly, we're all sort of self-righteous hypocrites anyway. We all need mercy, so we should give it. We should ask and seek and knock for God to help us do all of these things because what it's ultimately about is the golden rule of whatever you would want others to do to you, do to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Jesus says all of that through Matthew 5, Matthew 6, Matthew 7, and then he capstones it and seals it with this. Enter by the narrow gate. So often we kind of remove this verse from the context of the chapter, but it's there for a reason. What he's saying is the wide way is do it your way, or the wide way is blow off the Sermon on the Mount. The wide way is I want religion, but I don't want the sacrifice of the kingdom. Like that's the wide way. But, but the narrow way is saying everything Jesus has said from chapter five to chapter seven is what we do. That's the kingdom way. That's the narrow way. That's the kingdom door that we are to live out. It's an otherworldly message for a world that desperately needs it. And then after saying that, he says, hey, here's all the stuff. Enter by the narrow door. He says, this is the difference between good and bad fruit, true and false following, and solid and weak foundations. So he is confronting, but he's also inspiring us to something different. Because he's saying, listen, if you want to just play patty cake with the religion for the rest of your life, feel free to do that. You totally can, right? Just make it about you, want what you want, love what you like, you know, do your own thing and everything else. But if you want to make a true, powerful difference, there's the marching orders just from there all the way to there, five to seven. And I think the core of this, the heart of what this is, if you want to take it seriously, the baseline is what we see back in Luke chapter 13. When he said in verse 30, note this, someone who seems least important now will be the greatest then. And someone who is greatest now will be the least important then. See, that is to be our constant day in, day out disposition. I'm not trying to be the greatest, the best, the boldest. I'm trying to be the least, the servant of all. Jesus says, that's the stuff of my kingdom, right? That's the stuff of being a true follower. That's the backwardness of what it is he advances. And we can hear this and say, right, but it doesn't work, right? It doesn't work in today's world. It won't work in the United States. We want success more than faithfulness. But remember what Jesus also said last week? It's from doing it this way that we see people come from all over the world, from the east, the west, the north, and the south to take their place in the kingdom of God. The question is not, does it work? The question will always be, do you want to be a part of what Jesus does to make it work? Let's go ahead and pray together. Jesus, throughout the gospel of Luke, you challenge our modern sensibilities. You challenge how we get things done. Right? Our world loves kind of the captains of industry, the makers of destiny, but you seem to value 
uh, the, the, the idea that we are servants of all, that we forgo our rights and privileges and comforts, and instead we embrace your kingdom, your desires, your gospel, that we would love people in such a radical and reckless way that sometimes religion could say, oh, is that safe? Is that okay? But I believe our mission is to out-love the world that we live in. We are to out-love people. The world talks about love a lot, Jesus. We know that, but, but we want to out-love in that regard. We don't want to be truly holy where it isn't just making statements, but it's making differences. And so I pray that you would help us to do that. I pray that especially today as we get ready for communion. And and I think about the fact that when you were calling a church to yourself and you were building a community, you said the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We would be gate crashers over Satan, sin, and death. And we know the way that happens is through life and peace and joy that comes only through obedience to you, through knowing that life is better with you and that life is better with you when we are in obedience to you, when we're living out what it is you've called us to. And so as we prepare our minds and our community, our own personal hearts for remembering what you've done. We also know that you have called us to do something based on what you've done. If we follow you, we model your kingdom in all that we do. And so I pray that as we have this memorial today of your death and resurrection, in that we would also be reminded of our commission and our ministry to be on your mission field as everyday missionaries, helping people to see that life is better with you. So Jesus, we thank you and we love you and your good name. Amen. I always appreciate communion because it seems to highlight different things in my heart or mind every time we do it. And I think for me, I've been just thinking more and more about how it is so easy to fall victim to wanting our own comforts or our own ease. I mean, I want that. And then I come to the table and I'm reminded of the fact that Jesus forgoes all of his rights, all of his privileges, all of his comfort and all of his ease to come to be a servant and to give himself in death so that I might have life and not life so I can just do my own thing in life, but life so that I could hopefully see others come to that life as well. See, that's what the table is all about. Now, some of you may be watching today and and you don't know Jesus. And this table is a table that he wants you to sit at, but, but you're not quite able to sit there yet until you say, Jesus, I need you. I, I need to think differently. I need to repent. I've been thinking a certain way in life and I want to embrace your way. If that's what you seek right now, that is a prayer for you. That is a prayer between you and Jesus where you say, Jesus, I'm letting go of my way, my old things. I'm embracing your new way, your new life. And I want to follow and walk with you in the way that you call me to narrow door living, embracing the Sermon on the Mount, being different in an all too common world, being holy in an unholy environment. See, if you do that, then this table, the first table is yours. And then if we live all that stuff out with just reckless abandon, that other table in the future where he pulls up the chair and serves, that's yours too. Now, for those of us who follow Jesus, we know what this is all about. On the night in which he was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread, he gave thanks to his father, he passed it out to his followers in training, his disciples. And he said, this is my body broken for you, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So at the end of the meal, he took a cup of wine and he says, this is the new agreement, the new relationship, the the very catalyst that changes everything, the birth of the kingdom shed through my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Jesus, thank you so much for your grace and patience. Thank you so much that you give us challenges to live differently. May we embrace those because life is better with you. And from that, others can have a better life as well. We thank you in your good name. Amen. Nothing but the
stream I want to sing the blessing over you again if you're there with your families just encourage you to hold hands be with one another receive this God's love for you he's bringing us through times and we would look back on these times and realize what God has taught us and how he has been with us and walked with us each and every step of the way. And may we be excited for what his future is and what God is going to do in our lives and the lives of this church, just thinking of uh, all the possibilities, the new people that are moving into here, building a building, um, the stuff that is taking place, new youth group that's going on. God has been good and continued to be faithful to us. And may he be faithful to you and your family personally. So if you feel comfortable to close your eyes, maybe just lift your hands up receive this here. Oh, and the Lord bless you, yes, and keep you, make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord turn see you. Next time I see you, I hope we'll be on the lot. Please come up and say hello. Give me a hug. If you're brand new, please introduce yourself and say, hi, I've never even met you before, right? And be there with us. We are excited to see you and uh, have a fantastic week, okay? Be praying about what God is going to do. Be praying about our future too in the fall and what that's going to look like. And um, you are sent out there now to be his light, his love, to spread that hope to the world around you, okay? Have a fantastic week. God bless you. We will see you next week. Bye-bye.